It is 5.30 and 31 seconds. Time to open the Planning Commission for Thursday, January 25th, 2024. Please call the roll. Mindy Payne. Here. Jason Cohen. Here. Jonathan Townsend. Here. Robert Gorenson. Here. Jaylee Klimpa. Here. Item number three, old business, we have none. Item number four, consideration of the consent agenda. Yes, for the consent agenda tonight, we have approval of the Planning Commission meeting minutes of January 11th, 2023. Thank you, and you are Chris, correct? I am, yes. Thank you, Chris. Okay, any questions or anything? Any discussion? Anything staff? Okay, the way... Um, 20, oh, I'm sorry, 2024. Yes, cool. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, the way it works with the consent agenda, there's one motion and one second and one vote for all items on the consent agenda. Um, unless something's taken, removed from the consent agenda, then it goes down to the next item, but that didn't happen. So may I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the cons uh, consent agenda. Please call the roll. Mindy Payne? Yes. Jason Cohen? Yes. Jonathan Townsend? Yes. Robert Gorenson? Yes. Jaylee Klimpa? Yes. Item five, consideration of items removed from the consent agenda. We have none. Item six, public hearings. 6A, please. Yes. Item 6A is a public hearing consideration of possible action regarding BAZ 1240-2023. It is a rezoning for the Williams property approximately 9.64 acres, A1 agricultural to RS3 single family residential, located east of Elm Place, 161st East Avenue, and south of Florence Street, 111th Street. Um, this property is unplatted. The property owner is rezoning the property to facilitate a lot split and build a residential home. Um, according to FEMA maps, none of the property is located within the 100-year floodplain. Water and sanitary sewer service is available from the city of Broken Arrow. Based upon the comprehensive plan, the location of the property and the surrounding land uses, staff recommends that BAZ 1240-2023 be approved subject to platting. Thank you very much, Chris. Any questions of staff before we open the public hearing? Okay, so I understand that the applicant is in agreement and is in attendance. Um, if the applicant would come down, please, and you have 10 minutes to speak. Madam Chairman, J.R. Donaldson, 12820 South Memorial Drive in Bixby, and I represent uh, Williams on this particular item. They're wanting this rezone so that they can uh, do a lot split. Uh, there's a family that wants to buy 2.78 acres uh, and build a house. Their house presently is on the south portion of the 9.64 acres. Uh, so since the original intent was to do a lot split, but we had to do a 60 foot wide access and that's, that's what kicked in this zoning. So the owner is asking if the plat waiver requirement could be, or the, the requirement could be waived even though zoning is approved so we could then just go forward with a lot split as opposed to going through the whole platting process because since they are selling the 2.78 acres they don't feel like it really benefits the public to create a subdivision plat for the house that they live in and the 2.78 acres that they're wanting to sell to build a second house for friends on that property so that's so i agree with the the staff's requirement for the for the approval of the zoning uh, so that we meet that requirement for that drive access or that panhandle, but we're asking a, a, a waiver of the planning requirement so that we can go straight to a lot split process. So you're only expecting one lot split, no that's more that, after that? That's correct. Okay. And, and uh, that's this, good. Is, this is an exhibit. So it would be 2.78 acres for the one, and then theirs is the 7.20 acres okay. where their house presently is. And since all the utilities are in place. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, there is no issues from staff regarding that, is there? You want to speak to that? For that? I would say, JR, do you know the right of way on Florence at this time? Uh, the previously, there was about a. 
On Florence, it's 24.75. It's 24.75 was there. When this particular lot split was done, it might have been taken up to 50 feet. And they have no issues in dedicating that additional 24.25. So to the benefit of the city, if the Planning Commission agrees upon waiver of the plat, we would recommend that we waive the plat subject to the street right of way and 17 and a half foot front utility easement being dedicated at the time of the lot split or being approved simultaneously with the lot split. So are you going to need a clarification on the amount of right of way on there? The 50 the foot right versus what? 24 It's supposed to be 50 feet from the center line. I mean, are you going to want that number in a motion if that motion was made? Okay. Yeah, because I'm not if, saying anything in the documentation. If right. you're making the motion to waive the plat, the waiver of the plat has to be approved by the city council. So you would be just making the recommendation to the city council to count for the council to waive the plat subject to the property dedicating the right of way and the utility easement. Yeah, I was just want to make sure we got the right amount of right of way that you're asking for. Mm -hmm. And sound like yeah, the yeah, applicants in agreement to it. Yes. So. Okay, thank any you. Other, I'll answer any other questions. Okay, any any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any pink sheets in front of me, so I'm assuming that no one signed up to speak to this item. Did we have anybody phone call in or email in regarding? Not to our it? knowledge. No. Guys. Okay. All righty. Thank you all. Okay, so this closes the public hearing. Unless any of the commissioners have anything further they need to ask the applicant. So this closes the public hearing. Any further discussion from anyone? Is it common to recommend a waiver of uh, platting? It's not very common except that we've done it in single lot type basis. Okay. It, uh, the benefit of platting uh, would not be that beneficial to the city. The main benefit is the fees that are dedicated with the planning process and the right-of-way. In this particular case, the right-of-way is more important than uh, the planning fees would be. Yeah, no, I But if we knew there was going to be more lot splits then, but now we got it where you can only lot split it two more, one more time after this one anyway. After the, they can't lot split it more than twice now, the way we got it written up, right? That's correct. Anyway, so forget I said all that. But One of, one of these planners down here may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's room to... I don't think there's room to lot split that thing anymore. There's not enough frontage. That's what I was yeah. thinking yeah. too. So, yeah. So they won't be up after this split. We'll zoning change and then a split. They won't be able to split again. Right. And they won't be going. Okay. Ahead. To to lay down the items that are determined in the platting process of utility easements, right of way, access points where the driveways are going to be and stormwater management. In this particular case on such a large tract, stormwater may not be that, uh, they may not have to do detention because they're gonna build a single family home there. The right of way is what we've addressed, the utility easement's important. Uh, the other items that the city would benefit from is just the fees for platting. Okay, anything further? Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion regarding this item? Well, I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendations on zoning change to the RS3, but the way, and including the way of the platting, but I also want to make sure that we get the right of way. That 50 foot number is what we're going to get on the way of the right of way, correct? Totally the dedication. If, if that's a motion, I'm good yeah. with it. And you, you need to state the motion. <laughs> I got to state that again? Yes, you do. <laughs> Golly, right? Uh, and the UE. Move to approve for staff recommendations, the zoning change, including uh, waiving the plat and making sure we get the 50 foot right of way dedication. And utilities. And the utility easement. And utility easement, yeah. Which I'll second what? that okay. motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second per staff recommendation plus some. Please call the roll. Mindy Payne? Yes. Jason Cohen? Yes. Jonathan Townsend? Yes. Robert Gordson? Yes. Jay Lee Klimpa? Yes. And this item will go before City Council on uh, February 20th, 2024. So 
Um, if you would like to speak on this item, you will need to come early to that city council meeting and uh, fill out a form to speak. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next item is uh, number seven, appeals. We have none. Uh, next item after that is item eight, general commission business. Item 8A, I believe Farhad will go ahead and take care of this item for us. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Planning Commission members, this uh, is the preliminary report for the housing and demographic study. The Broken Arrow Comprehensive Plan was adopted in 2019 and has class, classed uh, many items to be studied for the future. This particular item is recommended in the next comprehensive plan. So a little over a year ago, the city contracted with Points Consulting to prepare a housing and demographic study. They have been working with staff and a committee, a citizens advisory committee uh, over the last year and have come up with uh, this preliminary report. The preliminary report before us today is got three or four points and I will probably spend to save time address only two of those items. Uh, the, we are at a pro point where we're pre presenting the project overview and update, which I'll go through, the demographic and housing matrix, and then the community survey. The schedule for this project, and I won't belabor too much on it, is right here that we've discussed before. Trends in Broken Arrow population. So we've taken the over the 100 year, 120 year history of the city of Broken Arrow's population, and we'll address some of the other matrix a little bit later. This map before us shows our population today to be approximately a little over 120,000. In the map before us, the left map, which shows the Broken Arrow population growth over our entire history, shows that we've generally grown about 4.5% average in each year and decade. So, and, and I'll come back to this slide a, a little bit later. Our 2020 population, which has been put out by the Census Bureau, is confirmed. The 22 and 23 projections are put out by ACS, which is the American Community Survey. So going forward in this presentation, some of the data is from Census, and some of it is from ACS. Both are part of the uh, Bureau of Census. <clears throat> Median age and household with children in Broken Arrow, we are about 30, little over 38. And uh, that has gone up quite a bit over the last several uh, censuses. And this shows us how we compare to uh, some of the regional averages. Households with children in type in, in, in our country, in the state, and Broken Arrow, it just shows that we have a lot of young housing with children in our community. And I'll come, uh, as I'm going through this, some of these I'll go a little quicker to save time, and I can come back to it if you have questions, or you can stop me if you have questions right now. The annual employment and wage growth rate of the city over the, since 2010 uh, is shown over here. Tulsa County is in uh, kind of the blue color. It's a little hard to distinguish the color here. Widening County and the state and so forth. And this particular map, uh, I communicated with our consultants that it, uh, they have an explanation of why Widening County is so high, but we're gonna probably revise it and take a look at it what has happened in the last decade in Wagner County, there's been a demographic shift in the number of jobs and the number of total income. So I, in my opinion, that is a fairly large uh, item over here, particularly in this column. So it does not really affect this particular study, but these are, the first half of the report is basic data <coughs> that the government, the federal government has put out on Broken Arrow. Employment by industry, and again, there's a lot of detailed information over here. It shows about where majority of the employment in Broken Arrow is. Uh, Owner-occupied and renter-occupied homes. A lot of this study, as you all know, have been doing about our housing. 
what is the housing stock? A lot of growth in Broken Arrow has happened between the last uh, uh, 40 to 50 years, and a lot of those uh, houses are now approaching that age in, uh, in their life cycle that needs to be addressed. So in Broken Arrow, we have 72% uh, seven, of the housing stock that shows up in owner and the balance in the rental, rental housing. Uh, this map is important to be discussed a little bit later when we compare our matrix with other cities. Uh, sir, I do have one question regarding that. Um, as far as the difference between rent and owner, is that specifically for like apartments and duplexes or is that also accounting for home, uh, a person that owns a home and renting it? This figure is, includes single family homes as well as multifamily homes. The only figure that it may not include would be what is called congregate housing, which is, includes nursing homes and things of that nature. That housing stock in Broken Arrow is within 2% or a little bit less. So 72% uh, of our homes are occupied by people living in it that, that own that property. Now, you do have a question, uh, the way a lot of homes that are owned by a trust, technically, there, there's an economic term for that. Technically, the trust owns the home. Mm -hmm. The people living in it are the trustees. But this particular figure includes all of that. So it includes the trust ownership as well. I think you might be uh, okay. heading for that. But what it shows that in, in the country, 65% of the homes are owned. This figure is lower than the year 2008. The highest home ownership was in 2007, and it, the trend changed quite a bit in 2008. But this is based on current 2020, uh, 2020 census. Wagner County, you can see, is 80% of home ownership, which is a very high figure compared to the state and national uh, demographics. This particular chart just shows the growth activity, the home building activity in Broken Arrow over the last uh, 15 plus or 17 years. Uh, this is just a heat map showing where all the building permits were issued. Uh, now, home values and trends. The, uh, again, the blue line on the left side is Broken Arrow, then yellow is Tulsa County, and Widening County is, I think, black. It shows us how the value of homes started with about 100 to 175,000 and have edged up to well over 250. There's another slide that will show us a little bit better what this trend means. But if you look at it, the cost of housing in Broken Arrow has started going up more than the normal trend from 2019, which is the start of the pandemic, which we all know that the housing market has gone up uh, quite a bit since then. The ratio of median home value to median household income ratio, it may not be pertinent for us to, at this level to consider, but when we compare our matrix with other cities, Nationally, this is a very important economic trend. And what it shows is that our in, uh, the lower the number here, 2.9, means income levels are much better than in other communities. The higher the number means people are paying more of their income towards housing oh, okay. than they're making. Traditionally, over the last 75 years, banks have changed the formulas on what is considered to be the uh, housing share of a person's income. That has changed dramatically also in the last three years uh, due to the pandemic, but I'll come back to that, uh, to that a little later. Well, you know, Farb, let me ask a question. Yes. A lot of this stuff's over my head anyway, but on that one there, like what you're talking about, the median home value based on the income, is that like, what, so if you have two parents working in a home, do they divide that by two also? That's a household income, so in the household, there is a small percentage of households that may have uh, more than two incomes. Majority of the households will have one and a half incomes. 
so two spouses working, but one may be working part-time, and in some cases, one may be working full-time. So the household income has a definition that the Census Bureau has defined. Ours will be, uh, I don't have that here, but it'll be less than two, but up higher than 1.5, which is, again, a very healthy number. So, so the higher the figure is on the graph, the more of their income goes Correct. towards just housing. So in the country, uh, 40, for, sorry, 4.3 uh, is the ratio of their home value to their income. So people have to pay more money per month to rent or buy their home. Then in Widener County in Oklahoma is pretty similar, but Tulsa County it shows that people have to pay more to buy or rent a home. But if you're throwing a total income of like two people working versus a single Correct. parent or single person, you know, it's got the same type of house and everything, all of a sudden that number change goes from one side to the other. Does that make sense? Yes. Unless, and unless you are able to factor that in. Recent figures, uh, the state of Oklahoma is doing studies, and I'm not here to talk about that today, but I'll mention that because that news release was released last Friday, that for an average family in Oklahoma uh, to rent or rent and or buy a two-bedroom, two-bath home for a standard family is approaching between 90 and 99 hours of work per week which is not a very good figure because that means both spouses have to work full time and one has to work, if you consider a 40 hour week, 90 to 99 hours is pretty high. But that hours. is not in the Census Bureau figures, that is state figures, so I'll, I can come back to that later. Uh, Tulsa County housing market trends, uh, by year on, on this, uh, the left chart, is uh, units that were sold in Tulsa County. This data is only for Tulsa County available on MLS that was available to us. We have not been able to get our hands on Wagner County MLS data, but Wagner County MLS data is very skewed, but uh, anyway, this is what we have to go with right now. Uh, the Tulsa County home sale prices, uh, you, the, you can see that Back, uh, it was in the range of below 200000 and the median price, and I guess we know what the average is on median, there's a subtle difference between the two, has gone the, uh, the average, which is the yellow or the gold line on the top, has put housing in Tulsa County and Broken Arrow at between two hundred fifty and $268,000 which is, again, a very high number in, in historical terms. The rental rates, and this includes uh, multifamily rental and rental homes in Broken Arrow. Uh, and this chat, uh, second map, I'll come to it, this shows the number of, the apartments are generally one, two, and three bedroom apartments. When you get into four and five, that's your housing uh, rentals. But the, this is the, uh, the black box is the l low to high rent rate of rentals in Broken Arrow. So 22 is the latest figure that we have. Again, you've seen that since 2019, the figure has shot up considerably. Does that have anything to do with the short-term rental trend that's been going on in the country? That's a good question. We, we've addressed that and the answer was no on that, that the short-term rental has not. We have, uh, we're not sure, but the short-term, our housing stock is over 46,000 units and our short-term rental is lower than 150, we, we believe. So the percentage of short-term rental is a very small number to make an impact in 46 mm -hmm. or 45,000 houses. Thank you. The rental uh, prices by unit, as, as you can see, the number of, if you rent a four bedroom or a five bedroom home or an apartment, it goes well about 1,500 or uh, 
Well, actually, two thousand dollars there. Uh, community benchmarking. So th this, we are now entering the second phase of this report. The part of the study involved benchmarking our community with other similar cities in our region, all across the country. So the consultants started looking at 20 to 25 different cities that had similar economic characteristics as us. With staff discussion and committee input, we increased that list to about 30, and then sub about 30 or 31. And subsequently, uh, I've added five more cities in Oklahoma that, are, that do not have the same metrics as us, other than their, their neighboring communities, so we put that in there. So some of this data is comparing Broken Arrow to 36 other cities on economic terms, not necessarily on demographic terms. And I, I can come back to that. So the communities in the 30, in, include cities, of course, in Oklahoma, Colorado, Arkansas, Indiana, Kansas, Missouri, Georgia, and Texas. And of those, we have, the consultants have picked nine cities that have very similar economic characteristics to compare us to. And I'll come back to that. So here are the different cities for regional population comparison, uh, and particularly the population change between 2010 and the last census of 2020, and of course the last two years. So the in this chart, the blue is the growth of the decade, and subsequently, after the census was taken in 2020, the yellow of the gold color, and I will clarify that, that that's an ACS figure, which is considered an estimate. Uh, and we we'll, can discuss that difference a, a little bit later. So uh, again, Broken Arrow, you can see in this column that we have a larger share. We are only in the third place behind Louisville, Texas, and South Fulton, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta, uh, in the growth since 1919, sorry, 2019 and 2020 till now. So the, the pandemic has really changed the demographics and some of the economic factors quite a bit. So. The consultants have studied metrics such as population, median income, households, percentage of owner-occupied, monthly housing costs, and home values. So how does Broken Arrow compare to these other cities? And I'll come back to that a little later. Where Broken Arrow is above average, in the green category on the left-hand side, the column next to the number is we are this number of 36. So for example, single family homes percentage is 81, uh, a little over 81%. And we are the sixth highest of the 36 cities that we compared. Uh, owner occupied is 72. To my surprise, uh, 70, Two is the national average also. Uh, these, the, this data has been given to us by our consultants and they've collected it from different sources. The primary source when you get beyond the census and ACS is ESRI. ESRI is a private data firm that puts out a lot of data, plus MLS and other platforms that this data is collected from. So I'm a little bit surprised that we are at that level, which is the 10th largest in the 36 city uh, matrix there. The gray column in the middle is the average, where Broken Arrow say home value income ratio is 3.23, and we're 11th of the 36 cities. So that means 10 cities of the 36 have, in my mind, more income than the houses are. And the other 30, uh, other 
25 have less. Again, by itself, let's not take any one matrix to be considering as a judgment factor of what that community is. Because sometimes having, uh, and the reason I say that is in Wagner County, or if you look at Rogers County, the numbers can be very skewed based on one major employer. Like Rogers County has two or three very large employers that have very high valuations such as Amazon. So uh, it, that one matrix can skew the figure quite a bit. We're broken arrows below average, and that's a good item. It, the word below may s seem bad, but our median monthly housing cost is $1,531. We're the 30th of 36, which is on the good side. Yeah. Uh, now, so like that. part of the study that the consultants did with the help and input of the advisory committee is that they put out a 20 four-point uh, questionnaire mm -hmm. that was uh, distributed between uh, September and November last year. And we got about 4,000, a little under 4,000 responses. Uh, and they'll explain here how they, uh, they took we won't go into all the 20 or 25 responses, how our own citizens who took this survey think about housing and demographics in Broken Arrow. The reliability of this service, they are, uh, our, our, our consultants are planners, but they're also economists, so they always put a disclaimer on uh, margin of error, plus or minus, There's in any kind of survey you do. There's a, a, our response rate was 4.4%, which is very good. Generally, all surveys nationally are between 4 and 5%. So anything over 4% is considered very good. Margin of error is about 2%. And this kind of explains what the survey has, has shown here. We also use the consultants also used a cleanup code that they do every time you respond to a survey that some people who respond will have a bias in one question. They may respond in a certain way, but they may mean something different. So there's a cleanup code that you do, do an exercise on to come up with the final figures. And this is a little explanation of that. For example, one of the respondents had put this as a comment in their survey. And this is just an example of some of the comments that were made in the survey that might have been excluded by our uh, code people. <clears throat> so one of the questions in the survey, we asked all of Broken Arrow, how do you want Broken Arrow to be de defined over the next 10 years? And some of this tells a story that we know what the people generally want. 62% of our community wants to be a suburban community, 14% uh, bedroom, and 10, uh, sorry, 23% twi uh, wants to be a big, big economic hub. There are definitions in here. I, I can come back to that in a little while. Then we asked what you would like to see the city of Broken Arrow's housing stock to increase. How would you like it to be? So focus on more. This is not surprising, though the figures are a little, uh, a little difficult for our future from a planning perspective, that to be a city of more than 120,000 people, uh, you have to provide all types of housing. That's something that some of us have been discussing for a long time. So 31 or 32 percent want to remain more of single family. 34 percent here, uh, yeah, so I guess you can tell. <laughs> well, you know, it's typically what we see in here anyway, far yeah. and when I did the survey, it's the same thing. People just don't want other people to move in here, no matter what. And they darn sure don't want the apartments, but they don't want more people. 
That's, but then again, they moved in here too, so. That, that's but, one way of looking at it, but again, if you look at it academically and proprietary wise, this data tells us the story of what our people are thinking. However, when you ask them with color pictures, some of, the, some of that changes here. So let's go to the next one. Would you like to see the city of Broken Arrow's housing stock increased? That's from the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Renters and homeowners disagreed on that topic. Makes sense. And, well, which is pretty clear. Well, what, what was meant by uh, bedroom community? Uh, I, I wasn't clear on that. Those, uh, in the questionnaire, one of the questions was, are you renting or buying? So those people who answered renting were put in the rental category. But the bedroom, bedroom community addresses that they work in Tulsa and they oh, live so, in Oh, sorry, the definition yeah. of bedroom? Yeah. Yes, I was, I was confused. Yeah. The bedroom community definition is that Broken Arrow historically has been a bedroom community where a little over 70 percent, the figure might be 76 to 78 percent of our workforce works outside our city limits. But live in Broken Arrow. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, that figure has changed from the, uh, we have that, but it's not in this presentation. I'll probably collect that data a little bit later. At, to give you an idea, four uh, census ago, that figure was in the uh, middle to upper 80s, and that has dropped into the 70s. So that means that we have more people working in Broken Arrow today than we did in the 1980, 1990, I remember when Tony Patrick, when he was on city council, made a big deal out of that that finally showed that we weren't quite the bedroom community. Right because we had more people working in Broken Arrow than actually driving to Tulsa. Yeah. And that metrics aligns with your labor force metrics, what a labor force is. Uh, I glance over that slide quicker, but r really a uh, ma large majority of our population works outside the city. And then when you start looking at geographically, if I do a GIS or MIS, uh, uh, heat map, you'll see that large majority of their population is at the airport, hospital complexes, downtown Tulsa. There's a little small heat map showing up in Muskogee. So uh, there are people commuting from here to Muskogee as well. And a lot of things that keep them Broken Arrow working is the schools, uh -huh. the city of Broken Arrow, mm -hmm. things like that. That keep so, people living and working in Broken Arrow. Of the 20 plus questions that we had asked, the consultants put all this data together, what does this mean? And the following few slides will show us that this is the purchase, uh, perceived purchase cost. In general, respondents feel Broken Arrow is less expensive to own. And, and this shows how many percent of our people feel the, the blue, or the dark blue color, navy blue color, that people said we are too expensive, uh, fairly priced, and so forth. This was the response from the three or 4,000 people that responded to our survey. Again, some of them, and uh, I'll come back to that, is that uh, between 500 and 680 respondents were not counted in some of these because they didn't qualify <laughs> since they don't own property or live here. And I think that's what that number on the bottom, the 3686 is the number that actually responded to make that percentage, wasn't it? That's yes, correct. that's yeah. correct. Yeah, all these slides, are al almost all of them will have a number down there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That'll give you the actual count. So 3,800, 3,666. That one is 3,623. Wow. This one is 3666. something from that committee. And this one is 3686. It's, it's over my head. Rental costs. So this tells us the people who feel like we're too expensive or somewhat expensive. 42% of our population feels so that makes sense. we are, yeah. Though comparing us to 36 other cities, you will go back, we're not. <coughs> 
This is more of an explanation of the geographic preferences for housing types from a, a economic perspective, and I can come back to that too. So the questions that we asked in this survey, the responses that we got were more pertinent and clear where there were pictures included. So when you asked a question, if you remember that survey that we did last year, if it showed this picture, the most people who responded says, generally citizens are okay with each housing typology if it stays in its lane. And in its lane means like, when you show them this picture, like would you like this type of housing the as long as it's not in their backyard. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, in their, in their lane. Yeah. Yep. Over, yeah. A couple miles that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting also that a lot of citizens are generally comfortable with dense housing options in mixed use areas. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to see that. I didn't I expect that. Keep in mind that uh, our new zoning code proposes and uh, allows ADUs. That doubles the density of a neighborhood. So the citizens largely, well, I mean, uh, okay, so this was, this is the preliminary report that the consultants have put together. They'll be here. Uh, in the next month to present this to our advisory committee and our council and, and so forth. And uh, here are the dates on that. What, if you have any questions, and I'll come back to that. One thing, I, at staff level, you may have seen this particular slide. Yeah, so I was gonna... Reason I talk about this is that when we started, when the railroad came to Broken Arrow in 1902, this was our population, and we are pushed, we are approaching 121,000. What started the growth was many factors, but this map shows some of the key planning factors that the Planning Commission and the City Council were involved in. But see, at 1970, I know you're going to say it's a BA Expressway, but actually, that's when I moved here. Population 11,000, I guess we left the gate open or something. Cause <laughs> <laughs> so, they just sorry, kept coming in. I, I was just eating up some of your time, sorry. Actually, actually, part of the BA, I think it opened in 64. This says 66. Well, you got to remember, 51 came through down Kenosha Street and all that, remember? Yeah. Before it yeah. had the That was in one. the 90s, yeah. Yeah, and then it was two lane to four lane. So that, that was uh, this item right here. Well, so th this is just the uh, demographic growth history of Broken Arrow. The question here is, this is going to continue, in our opinion. The consultants are recommending, and it will com come to that slide a little bit later, 4.5% growth. So that went from 2.7, so now it's 4.5, you're saying? This is 4.5% growth. Okay, I thought it was 2.7. So the bottom was a 2.7 down there, I guess. So let now, me ask you this, Farhad, since the Creek Turnpike and everything, you know, the South Loop, all that, you know, add, it was cumulative to add into that percent change. Do we know what's going to come in to keep that? Is, is that going to continue to slope with what's existing now? What's going to come in there to increase? Have we thought about what might come in? What's well, going to increase? these are analytical items. Uh, there may not be one good answer to that, but Broken Arrow's quality of life, affordability, yeah. our school systems, so our idea. safety in our community, all of those things today <laughs> increase the quality of life, which increase the growth. The question I would have to our city leaders in the future is, do you want to be that way? 33% of the people in that earlier survey said no. Right. right. But see, you got things coming in there that maybe the amphitheater comes in, maybe doesn't. The school's going to continue to grow, so it, we know it's going to increase. They go hand in hand like that. 
But then you got things like the exit ramp that might go off the turnpike over by the uh, reserve center, things like that. On the There's little things like that could add. Easy to get on a highway to get to Tulsa if it's no longer a bedroom, or if it's still a bedroom community. It, it's a, what, what we're doing on that discussion is that you're deducing from the facts that we presented is what's going to happen here. <clears throat> then the an analytical part of it, how do you want it to happen? Well, it's just amazing from 1970 to 2020, 2023, whatever, it's been consistent pretty much, well, that ramping up like it is. I don't know how it would be any different. Really, if you look at this whole line, it it's a pretty consistent, consistent yeah. straight line. Yeah. So this, to me, when I, when I look at this, what I really glean from this is we hear all the time, right? We don't want any more growth. We don't want any more growth. We don't want any more growth. Yeah. But that's our story. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, for the last 50 years, We've been on a pretty steady growth rate. It's not like we're doing anything drastic to, to ramp it up. We've stayed pretty linear here. And see what runs pretty much parallel with that is school growth, too, because mm -hmm. it's got to happen. you got more residential roofs. you got more schools. I think and so people, they run in the same thing. People want to keep it the same, but it's never been the same. It's always growing, and that's, I think that's the message. That I, I that's see, my biggest takeaway from I this. can see where it stays the same slope, but the question is, what's going to kick it up another? And that's what I was asking, maybe the exit ramp, things like that. Well, or will they just contribute to keep that same percent slope? I from no 2020 to 22 or 23, only the major event has been the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But look at this growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think my deduction is the growth is going to happen. The Planning Commission and our City Council and our City Leadership has to de decide if we want it at this rate. The demographic trends and the rental trends and all the type of housing trends is going to also dictate that we need other type of housing besides the single family homes. Oh yeah, I don't think you're going to I don't think you're going to change the slope. So we've gone from 90 in the four uh, Again, that'll be difficult, but four decades or five decades in 70 or 80, the type of single family housing that was at 93, 94% has now dropped to eight, uh, what was it, 82%. So of the 46,000 houses that we have, the percentage at one time of single family detached homes with attached garages was uh, in the 93 or 94 percent range. That number has dropped to 80 or 82 percent. It's going to continue to drop further. That means there'll be more other type of housing. The other factor is that, and uh, let me come, let me show you. Uh, Average persons per household, I, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, okay, the, I haven't got the slide here, but we have the data for that. The population, the cohorts, every five-year cohort, the fastest growing cohort is over 65. We had 9% in our previous uh, 2000 and 2010, we had 9 to 10 percent of our population in that category. Today, that per percentage has moved to 15. That means we have more older people living in Broken Arrow than we did 10 and 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. That population trend of the people over 65 is one of the fastest growing cohorts. The cohort between 5 and 10 and 10 and 15 has actually flattened out. Say that last part again. The, the younger population yes. cohort, percentage-wise, not numbers, percentage has flattened. Well, it, it makes sense that was happening because in the, what, 80s and 90s, we were the fastest-growing city in Oklahoma, right? Right. I don't know if we still are or not, but that age group is catching up Correct. to that. So that is the demographic part of this study where the makeup of our population, there are more older people, as compared to in the 1980 census, there were many younger people. Right. So the gap that was there between older and younger is narrowing. That means services, housing included, that the city has to provide in the future 
has to cater to older people. Yeah, it needs to be broader to cover the old people in the retirement centers. Mm -hmm. And have more pickleball courts. That's <laughs> 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 a backhander right there. He's just kind of old. <laughs> no. I know I'm old. But I appreciate the pickleball reference, though, but well, that's good to me. No, but the, these are things like if you see, we have a lot of soccer fields. You have Indian Springs Sports Complex and all that. That's going to be needed, but we're going to need things for our changing demographics, including the housing stock. The 82% or whatever the number is of single family detached housing, that number may shrink a little bit, and by market demand, it will. But there's other uh, economic factors going beyond the market demand. So let me ask you this, and far hard, because this is probably what a lot of people are thinking, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to be on that housing committee. You know, we know the senior citizens, that there's so many of us, so many that coming up that they got to have places to live if they want to be in Broken Arrow. What about, you know, and if you have an apartment complex for 55 older, 55 age group or older, you know you need that for those people. But what about just a regular old apartment for any, do, what, is there anything in here telling us that we need more apartments based on that? other than the survey of people saying, ah, yeah, we don't want those, or we think they ought to be there, or? I would put it that instead of saying apartments, we need more attainable housing. And attainable housing means that is more affordable to a broader spectrum of our community. That would include apartments, it would include duplexes, triplexes. So you don't want to say affordable, you want to say attainable. Attainable. It makes sure it's there. Yeah. Okay. So we need that variety. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's the thing. Okay, I'll, yeah, I agree. I'll come back to the, so, mm -hmm. Councilor Gorenson, what you were asking earlier, this is uh, the age, percent of age population cohort. Oh, I didn't see this that may be here. a little hard to read. And I, I think this is a little, uh, wow. some of these slides are going to be corrected because uh, it's hard to collect data from census and then compare it to the ACS update. But anyway, this is a correct trend that you look at. On the very left column is the five-year age cohort, the youngest population and the oldest at the very bottom. See, that tells you how I'm many. This. I don't remember seeing this in the committee meetings. We have so many data slides like this. It's hard to do it in a presentation that. It's less than an hour. <laughs> no, I'm interested in seeing it. I didn't know that was in here, so that's the first time I saw it far hard. That's a good one. So same last page. What now uh, the population cohort, this chart may be a little bit more easy to read numbers wise. So on the very left side uh, is the youngest population of People, uh, kids up to five, and the oldest is 85. And the, the middle, of course, is 35 to 45 and so forth. So this is the age cohort showing from the year 2000 is blue, uh, orange, and then green or whatever the color is, the, uh, yellow. So we are seeing how our population is shifting. If you look at over 55, 55 to 60, 60 to 65, the right side columns, which are the recent decades, is going up compared to the year 2000, just the last 20 years. So that story is telling you that our older population is aging more than hanging the, around. And the younger population, see the so, for example, in the year 2000, you had almost 8,000 children under the age of five. Today, that number has dropped from 8,000 to about 6,500. And it's not the number, it's the percent. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. And we'll have, we have a breakdown of this, and it's a lot of information. But you'll be getting all of that data in, in a book at the end with all kinds of information in a matrix. So keeping in mind, this is a preliminary presentation of the findings for our hmm. housing and demographic study. Now, this will bring questions to the table, definitely. People will have to start thinking. Uh, our median age, 
So if you look at what I was saying earlier, in 1960, the median, look how young our population was. That means half the population was less than 26.9 and half was over 26.9. Today, that half has moved to 37.6. Now, we prepared this map today from the 22 ACS is based on 21 figures, but there's, I saw a recent figure that came out and we are edging 38% here. So in my opinion, half the population in our city is below the age of 38, and the other half is above the age of 38. <clears throat> so when you go back to 1960 and 1970 and 1990, when Broken Arrow is a very young community, we are catching up. We're no longer that young community in my perspective here. So let me ask you kind of a question. When some of these people are coming in from out of town, they have their pre-developments, they want to rezone for, you know, uh, apartment complex or something like that. They've gone through these numbers. Do they present those numbers with planning staff and say this? Because we don't usually see that at the planning commission. But is it, where they say, hey, we show a need for that and stuff, is these the kind of numbers they go through to show you they, guys? Or This will be available to everybody on our website the moment it gets approved and adopted here. So uh, there, and to step back, the state of Oklahoma is doing a housing study from a rental perspective and cost perspective. The city of Tulsa is doing their own study on housing and demographics. A lot of cities are right now doing this type of study. This data will be available to all developers. Mm -hmm. So if a developer wants to come into the city and uh, recommend a particular type of housing, they can use this data. This data is not proprietary. Right. So far, most of it is, even the economic data is coming from different platforms. Our consultants have just put it together. Whether it's ESRI or MLS or Census or ACS or uh, Oklahoma City, uh, the state putting that figure out, we've collected so uh, data from all these sources. So it's public information. Were you, were you guys able to gather any data relating to anything based on different ethnicities at all? We have that as well, yes. Our ethnicity figures are... Are they in this packet? I have, a, I think I have a paper copy not to show it, but that has changed quite a bit. One of the changes in ethnicity, what has happened was that prior to 2010, the, based on federal law, the Census Bureau asked questions of a certain number of races. So when you filled out a survey, you had either between seven and nine choices. In 2010, the law changed where the ethnicity uh, categories were increased. And this last census was one of the first long census. There are several census that they do. The, first long census where they asked multi-race. And that multi-race number has shot up dramatically that was not there in previous demographics. So a good percentage of our population that in those earlier surveys identified with one race is of one parent. Now a lot of them have gone to just checking the multi-race box though one parent could be of one race and the other parent could be of another race. Uh, that is a national trend that is changing quite a bit in particularly the uh, more populated states on the East Coast and West Coast. Uh, but that has skewed our population demo, uh, race by race population quite a bit. So if you were to ask the in the 1960 or in 1990 census, we had a very high percentage of people that filled out the survey that, uh, that associated themselves to being Caucasian. 10 to 15% of them have moved away from that and classifying themselves as multi-race. So that one race that was that high has dropped in number. Is that 
I might be making too complicated here, but. No, I was just curious as to um, any information you might have had or, or could speak to um, that, that touched on any trends that were related to ethnicity. So that's, that's, that's good information. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring that. I, I was also thinking about, you know, the, the trend, the, the growth that we've had, too. I, I didn't know if there were any significant changes that were, you know, due to certain populations finding the city more desirable or if you had noticed, hey, we have more people from here than ever before or if there was anything that you had just noticed uh, based on the collection. Definitely. The simple answer on ethnicity is that, yeah, there's, we are more diverse today. There's more ethnicity here today than was in each of the previous decades. And we'll get you that number. We have that, but uh, I apologize. I don't have a slide for that. And uh, let me see. I think no, I think this is the last one. This, this was something we did for our city ward boundaries that may be of interest only to the city council as we are divided into four wards. But I think the, the Census Bureau has their website. You can actually go in there and it's got filters and stuff and you can have it generate tables. It's been a long yes. time since I've been in there, but isn't that right? Yeah. It, you can tell it. And I, it's not called the Census Bureau. There's another website, that a branch of that or something. What is the, it? Is it ACS problem? I don't know. Well, the but anyway, you could go in there and just it'll, and they could probably get that for you. So. That data no, is by question. census track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's based Not on the census. By our our ward boundaries generally cover all census tracts. Um, so anyway, that uh, it, it's kind of a and and by the way, th these are the thirty six cities that I mentioned that we're doing peer comparison uh, from communities in about six or seven states around here. And the broken arrow on this particular one is owner-occupied characteristics. Close to 73% of our housing is owner-occupied. I had a... Uh First, this is great information. There's so much there that tells a story. Um, but one of the questions I have is in regards to the growth at 4.5%, is there any comparison with the other suburbs of Tulsa to see what their growth is in their trends as well as Tulsa? Because I'm just curious, right, we're at 4.5%, but is all of a sudden Owasso at, you know, 6.5%, which may result in a slight decrease in population growth in Broken Arrow. But at the same time, you might see a significant drop in Tulsa and a rise in all the suburbs, right? So I'm just curious if there was a comparison with the local, even though they're not the same size. We haven't, we meaning the consultants and our staff have not done that for this particular study. But in 2016 and 2017, I prepared a demographic study at that time that has 2015 or 2016 data that shows the cities in Oklahoma by population and percentage growth. The, the figures and percentage-wise are skewed because when you have a city of, say, 10,000 that grows by 1,000, that's 10%, but a city of our size, 121,000 people, we will not grow by 10%. That's too high yeah. a number. Understood. So as the cities grow, like Oklahoma City and Tulsa, their percentages will be smaller. But we can uh, try and get that data for you. I have that from uh, 2015, but I don't have it right now today. Okay. As Farhad mentioned earlier, uh, the state is doing this kind of on a broader level too. So that information hopefully within the next what, 12 to 18 months will become available for those kinds of comparisons. And a lot of, as he spoke earlier, a lot of the surrounding communities are starting to do this as well. So it's such a hot topic that everybody's trying to take it on, uh, which is good. It, it brings it up in conversation and it also gives us more data to look at. So um, I think you're going to start to see more information coming out. Well, I also think that this looks, 
this shows a, a really nice story about how the city of Broken Arrow is a desirable place. We don't have houses that just jumped up $400,000 in value, making it unaffordable to live here, right? But there's been a steady increase in the value of homes, but nothing astronomical. And then, what, only 28% of the areas are rental homes or apartments, and national average is something like 30 Eight percent, thirty-five percent, something like that. So yeah, all all that tells a great story. So thank you for all the hard work that you guys have done on this. Thank you. We'll pass this on again. Uh, credit to our consultants. Points Consulting is the principal consulting group that we've hired for the study. They have teamed up with Johnson and Associates, a company out of Oklahoma City, that are also working on it. Uh, We'll have more GIS data and heat maps and maps prepared in the future for that. This is again a preliminary study that we, in that milestone that the consultants have prepared for us. This just gives us an information to think about and keep in mind next time when we have development cases, what, what should the city have in the future? What type of housing do you want? But those are, but that, that's good data and stuff, but it, it, it still doesn't tell us whether this certain location geographically in Broken Arrow should be that, right. other than the whole city we know. We know we need to add, you know, diversify around the city, but we right. gotta fit the pieces in the correct place in the <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know, you look at the Rose District and New Orleans Square, you know, they, those are different things around town. Then you still got to use, you know, uh, is that the best thing for that location or whatever? But it still shows you there's a need in the community of Broken Arrow. Mm -hmm. so. Geographically, this study would not tell us where the, right. the comprehensive plan, exactly. our next 2019 comprehensive plan that shows level of cities, level one, two, three, four, uh, type of land uses that we will have. That that would be still our approved comprehensive plan guide to, to work with. Now, uh, the, the consultants have also prepared preliminarily that we are not ready to, yet with are about 10 to 20, particularly 19 points or suggestion of what the city should do. They'll come back with those in the final presentation. Things such as promote ADUs, which we're going to do in our new zoning code. Uh, things such as promoting higher density or uh, attainable density, things of that nature. So there are a lot of solutions, suggestions that they will come up with. Where you apply them will be up to the Planning Commission <coughs> and City Council. Let me ask this question, Farhan. I know this isn't, it is off topic, but you know, we just did the comprehensive plan in 20, what, 2019? When will probably be the next time we do a new comprehensive plan? 20 years from then? So 2039 or something? No, hopefully on. sooner. Yeah. We do what? Should, we should I was going to say the faster, the more we're growing, I would think that you would do one sooner. Because it used to be, what, 83 was the year? Uh, and I don't remember what the next one was. In the it's past, like, cities have done it every 20, 20 years, but... Uh, as a fast-growing city, one can make a case that you ought to do it a little sooner than 20 years. And the rate of change, as we are seeing this growth the <coughs> trend here, uh, if your community was more dormant, uh, you do not need a new comprehensive plan that often. But our community is changing so fast, and the modes of travel, the 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 health industry is changing, transportation is changing, utilities are in demand. Uh, that brings out a need for the master plan. Well, with the electronic data you have and the easier way to collect the data and stuff, and the sooner you do a new comprehensive plan, I would think it'd be easier to do than to wait 25 years and do another one. I mean, because that was a total, the last two were totally rewritten, right? Because there's such a gap in between the two. <laughs> or how do we get? You know, but it's been five people. years already, so it's going to be time in another to five years. Our age. Yeah. 
You mean to move? Well, to move into, you know, move, come in. We're going to have to do different housing to get those people to come in. Well, that was on that chart, 30, yeah. 35 years mm -hmm. old or something was a yeah. big percentage. Mm -hmm. They're coming in. They just don't want other people to come in is what they say. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of made me. Or the 55 don't want people. <laughs> I'm 64. I don't care if they come in or not. Well, hi, I can say that. I'm that age. <laughs> has there has there been any type of survey that the uh, consultant company is able to provide to see what the newer generation is wanting in a community? Like what what would attract people to move to Broken Arrow, or any city in the country? But has that been something that's ever been talked about or brought up? There's a lot of literature out there. I don't think this study has called for it. Yeah. We can, you know, we can go through that to see what the national trends are. No, just There's curious. housing needs for our immediate needs are very apparent on the other, the extremes, the older population mm -hmm. that's growing. Mm -hmm. Do we have housing for all 65 plus people? And do we have housing for the under 25 or under 20? That, that's a different cohort. Uh, I would say that may be something to kind of address. Uh, and then, of course, the housing needs are there for the other age cohorts as well, 30-something and 40-something people. The issue right now is attainability, affordability. The average cost of the house that was 260, the starter home, uh, was 265 yeah, or whatever. That, that's a question. That is, I mean, when you get a, like a starting teacher. we are mm -hmm. in the country. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, we're well, better well, in the country than 30 other cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we are 30th. Let me ask you another question, Farhad. And I'm sure you people are getting tired of this. But anyway, <laughs> you, you've been here a few years. So if you were to plot on a chart, on a graph, Okay, and you had res number of residents. You said what, forty-six thousand a while ago? Re residential no. homes, households, households. Okay, forty-six, 46 thousand households. Forty-six and a half thousand. Well, if you were to put the residential homes versus units, not apartment, not not a apartment complex, but a apartment dwelling unit. So you have certain number of units in the building. You know what I mean? So if you were to plot that from nineteen eighty or whatever. Would that number look like pretty straight that the growth of the apartments was linear with what was going on with the residential? Or was it, it's a does that make steeper. sense what I'm saying? Do you understand what he's getting at? Yeah. Because I don't know what I just I think, said, but. Uh, <laughs> but, it, but I think it's. Grant me what I was asking. I, 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 I think okay. what you're asking yeah. is if you were to look at, at single family, mm -hmm. multifamily mm -hmm. growth, do they both look like this or. Are they slightly skewed with one another? Like is that, that what you're asking, essentially? Kind of, yeah. And, and I think that you can kind of glean that information from one of those slides earlier, that there has been a slight increase mm -hmm. in the number of multifamily That's what I to was single thinking. family. Because if you look at that data and you, and you see that, uh, what was it, 1980-something or other, we, we had a, um, something like 85% were single family. And then now we're looking at a certain percentage. We're in that 70 some odd percent, which was is still quite a bit higher than the national mm -hmm. average. And see, uh, and see, that's what that's my point. The percent growth of apartments versus mm -hmm. percent. Okay, what's percent growth of apartments for the last 30 years? What's percent of growth for uh, residential last 30 years? Is one like you know 4.8, and the other one's 8.2? I'm sure. Curious. So you're basically curious. asking for this, but in a but Something in a graph understand. that shows it by year, by decade, right? I don't know if that's that's because really this is the percentage of homes, percentage of rentals, right? But you'd want but, to see it more like a that, graph. Is that the apartment complex? Is that the number of units? I don't know what. That oh, and is. so that's yeah, that's just renter occupied. So that yeah, that could, that could be, be a single family home that's in there with that. Yeah. Or it could be multifamily. So it, it mm. isn't quite. Right. I, I get because they come I in saying we don't want apartment complexes, mm. but. Right. And, and I think sometimes people think that we're putting in way too many. Right. And I know that what we the vacancy is like six percent or something, so it's not very high, and that's the national average. But I was just curious at how the growth of those 
Because I know we have seen quite a few growths in the last 20 years. So I think that's probably, we could probably glean that data. Don't you think so far, Han? Oh, I'm just curious. You I, what I is, want you to what it becomes difficult is it, when you start <laughs> counting. <laughs> Why'd you ask it? You're spending our time. Sorry if I gave you a well, tasker. I was just curious. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm glad that you asked because there are a lot of people that think Yes. about the apartments and right. things like that. And if there was a, a line chart that actually showed that it's consistently growing right. at the right. same rate, then it would let people know that, yeah, what, what the city's doing is right on target. That's Bingo. what we want. Or we need to make a slight adjustment, right, to have those lines parallel with the, the rate of growth. And exactly. it was a really good question. Well, so, in the see, next question. Right now, people, you know, it's hard to say, well, these people want the apartments. There's a reason for it. They're not buying off on that. Yeah. But if you see it's consistent growth, like schools versus residentials coming in, you know that that they're running like that. I don't know about apartment. Now, one thing is, when and you got to be careful. You got to do the number of units that are in the apartment building, not just just an apartment complex. Right. Because some <laughs> oh, of them have yeah, a lot yeah, of them. Yeah. Some of them have. Those high numbers, they don't like that. We are pretty heavy on single-family homes and then apartment complexes. What about the middle housing? What about right. duplex and condominiums? And that, that too, yeah. So we haven't built really a condominium project. We built about three or four in the 1980s, what, two in the 1970s. But since then, we haven't built a true attached. What unit. were those? What were the two in the 80s? Uh, Commons, which is the rest of the South Library. Mm -hmm. uh, we built hmm. about several that are behind the old hospital. Fulton Street, west of Elm. Okay. Hmm. Those were two and four plexes that were built as condos. Now, hmm. one difficult thing to address, what you said earlier, uh, those have become rental units. The two units, which are Idlewild, Idlewild is on the south side of Jasper, 131st, about half, approximately half mile west of Elm. And in the Springs condos, which are east of Idlewild, are two condo projects that were built in the 70s. They are still owner, heavily owner-occupied, but over the decades, they've become rental, and we don't have total data for that. Mm. Well, you know, if, that would be good if, we, if, if the city had time to start putting numbers, whether they hire or summer kids come in here and help out and generate those numbers. Because that would be data you could add every year, and just and you could see that trend. What you're talking about, I think that would be a good tool to have. The question uh, also may be to to collect this data for current 2020 or 22 trends. I would suggest let's keep in mind 2030 and 2040. That's a population that's. Right now, you can call them millennials or younger people. Uh, they're looking for a different type of housing nationally. So we haven't done that study in Broken Arrow, but nationally, studies show that the younger generation are looking for different types of housing, besides having a three-car garage, big detached home. Most of them are at a certain season of life. When they have children in school, the patterns desire. But if they do not have children in school, being in a school district is not important to them other than quality of life. So one of the suggestions has been that we do not have is TOD housing, transit-oriented development. We have, are moving away from fixed transit to microtransit. So TODs may not make as much sense in Broken Arrow as they do in Oklahoma City or Kansas City right now. Kansas City is a good example of TOD-related growth in the center core. In other words, young people like Dallas is one that went through 25 years ago where the housing growth rate is phenomenally high within a one-mile radius of transit, available transit. Hmm. We don't have that. And our future of microtransit is a door-to-door -door service. That the, the TOD model may or may not work over here. But that's one of the suggestions that the consultants will have in their 20, the top 20 suggestions. 
So mobility, a national trend is that uh, a certain percentage of people under the age of 20 that, uh, that do not have driver's license has gone from 5% to 14. Oh, wow. Now, I do not know if that applies in Tulsa County, but nationally, uh, something like close to 14% do not have driver's licenses. But if they live in metropolitan areas that provide transit, they don't need a driver's license. But moving without a driver's license in Oklahoma is very difficult. Mm -hmm. You need a driver's license for, for almost everything. Let me get back to your question, if I might, if I may. Did, were you asking how to target a certain age group to come into Broken Arrow, or? Uh, well, kind of, yes, I was kind of piggybacking off of... Because I think I hijacked before you ever got a response, and I was wondering... Oh, I just, like, it seems like all of our kids moved out, you know, moved out of Broken Arrow. How do we get that generation to move back here? What type of housing do we need to get them to come back and to... Because 55 and over, like, that's going to start dying off. <laughs> but know? I thought I saw in the chart that 30 to 35 range or whatever was a high percentage of people moving to Broken Arrow. Yeah. I may but have misread it, too. Well, living in Broken what? Arrow. Living. Oh, so not moving, but living. Living, okay. living yeah. Living. Got it. So, yeah. but how do we get more going. of that generation where it's not like this, yeah. but like this, more where... An amphitheater, maybe. Maybe that... <laughs> That's next. I'm just teasing. <laughs> well, we'll I, talk about that later. I had a, Two sorry. weeks. I had, I had a question, too, um, for Hot. It was back on the employment slide, and I was, I was reading it, and it says employment in Broken Arrow. So these 57, 58,000 jobs are actually in Broken Arrow, correct? No. They no. Are, they're employed in that, in that industry, but not necessarily in Broken Arrow. Okay, that's what I was wondering. I, so, my, my, my question is, what, how many jobs are in Broken Arrow? 58, oh, in Broken Arrow yes. city limits? Yes. I was thinking that this was that, but no, if it's this not. Is, uh -uh. This is the workforce that Broken Arrow reside, citizens reside in. Yeah. But yeah, we'll try and get that. 22% uh, of the 58,000 live here. Uh, 20, work here. and I'm saying 22 a little loosely too. We'll get that data. Work here. Work here. 22 percent in our city yeah. limits of the 57,000 or 60 or uh, 58,000 work in Broken Arrow. 22 no. percent of that number work of in that Broken number. Yeah, right. but that, that number also lives in Broken Arrow, right? That they, they all live here. They live in Broken they don't Arrow. Work 22 percent of those folks work in Broken Arrow. Right. right. Isn't that what you're so, saying, Farhad? Yeah, 22 percent approximately of 58,000 live and work in Broken Arrow. Right. But the rest of it live in Broken Arrow but and work, work elsewhere. elsewhere and, my, and, and kind of to Mindy's point, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about how many job opportunities are in Broken are Arrow. In Broken Arrow. Yeah, that people might, might that. move to Broken Arrow to be closer to or uh, you know, to inspire them to be here. Someone. That is in the 2017 uh, study that I have, oh, and I, oh, I can share that with you. I'll send it to you all uh, to look at. Okay. Yeah. The, the numbers may have changed. The percentages haven't changed uh, that much. How'd you get those numbers in 2017 from March? ACS. And ACS also has 22 figures. We even have commute data. For example, right now, the average commuter in Broken Arrow uh, that used to be 19 point some minutes has gone up to 21 some minutes. Okay. To, of these 58,000 people, their one trip to commute is about 21 minutes every day. I think you know, I have that jobs number in an email. When I get back to my desk, I'll look and see. I was like, okay. economic development keeps a pretty. Yeah, I've, yeah. Got, I've got a pretty current yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to see. Get the numbers you want. Well, 
Farhad, you're about right with that 21 minutes, and I get mad when it becomes 25 minutes, I'll tell you. Unless your favorite song's on, right? <laughs> Unless your favorite song's on. Yeah, that's what I do. No, another great reason to live in Broken Arrow, as opposed to other places that people drive two hours to get to work and then two hours back. So. That's rough. Yes, I did the same thing. That's Freebird like three times. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> No, this is all great information, really appreciate it. And I know we've been asking some questions that caught you off guard. And, uh, but that's what this is just kinda, for. We, we've got to spark those conversations. No, you had to answer for everything, so. Yeah. Well, Farhad's been buried neck deep in this for a year, and he's, uh, I mean, he's got the history to back it up anyway. Um, so uh, there's nobody better, really. With no, it's been interesting. Uh, We've been keeping a lot of this data for a number of years. Today, the good thing is that uh, the Census Bureau, because of the technology and the ability to post data online, is just dramatically grown from 40, 50 years ago. There's so much data out there that, uh, and they have webinars on it almost every day, every week, to be able to use their, and to find that. What? You know, I know I'm maybe asking for a tasker, and you might blow me off, but at least it'll be in the minutes. But so, is it too much to ask for? You know, not by the next meeting, but over the time time period to put together, like going back to 1970 or 80, where we have some good true data data of when those apartment units came in per year based on. Because yes. I think we you have, already have some of that anyway. We, uh, we have prepared every subdivision that what? is platted by decade. That yes. heat map will come to you in, uh, in the next meeting. Okay. We have uh, mapped, we have 900 subdivisions of which uh, between 680 or so are residential. And we have the date of when they were platted. The difficulty is that Broken Arrow had a lot of development in the early years on land that is not platted. Hmm. So when you look at how old is your housing stock, by plat you can say what year the houses were built. Mm -hmm. But we have several or a few thousand houses that are on unplatted land mm -hmm. or older plats that we may not have accurate data. For example, in the downtown area, in the mm -hmm. uh, DROD district, we have between 2,200 and 2,800 residential lots, but a whole bunch of them have been rebuilt recently in the last, since 2017. Hmm. Okay. So, so now they're platted, but the other ones are not. But they were platted. Mm -hmm. there, there are yeah. seven, nine, or nine subdivisions here. Hmm. But if you go outside this area, like the one close to Lynn Lane, mm -hmm. you have 75 oh, houses that are. See, and I don't think it's asking too much for the apartments because, you know, I, I know I was on the Planning Commission 30 years ago before, but even when we built apartments or approved apartments over at 81st, I'm sorry, Houston and Aspen right there, they, they still look good, right, Farhan? By, uh, yeah. I forgot the name of them now. The one on Houston? But, yes. Aspen Creek. Right. But there was hardly many any apartment complex. You had Indian Springs. You had a few in Broken Arrow, but not all that many. So a lot of them were built after, and I think it'd be easy to get that data. We it, have I think it would be a good look at, so. We have a list of all apartments. We have a list of all subdivisions. Yep. And uh, it, this is a lot of data. We, the spreadsheets are very lo large and long, <laughs> so we can provide that to you. Our staff has been really working. Uh, grant staff has been helping with uh, uh, putting a lot of the data together, and we have that all the year the plat was filed, how many units, and now we're even going with GIS on putting in the section, location of the subdivision plat. And uh, we started keeping that back in the 70s when we went with the sewer system that was combined with Tulsa. So we keep a detailed track of which, we have three basins, which basin is the sewer system being going into. So we have RUMA that is owned half by Tulsa and half by Broken Arrow. So for those purposes, we started keeping that data from years ago. 
and I have that. Uh, that's pretty accurate data, but it gets too, too complicated to. Well, let me ask you one more question. So do we also have a data on the schools as they be, they're being built too, like, okay. The Broken Arrow schools have, and Union as well, has very good data on the number of schools and the enrollment. That's what I was, and, but that enrollment number changes, or not the enrollment, but the, yes. what, should capacity be the word? Capacity. Yes. Of per yeah. school, that changes over time, right? The capacity changes when they add on. Mm -hmm. The enrollment changes based on their master plan. But see, that would be a, number, a good one That'd to see good too. One to see. Mm -hmm. All three of those run together. Yeah. So I, I'm making notes of what the Planning Commission would like to see. For example, correct me or add with this list. One was the growth map showing single family and multifamily in, in the same chart, like yeah. how many single now family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then yeah. another graph was showing growth percentage of Oklahoma cities. Like, I think and we have that. He, he wants schools yeah. shown on that too. No, that will be another map. That's fine, but he wants to show the residential with the schools on the same one. School boundaries are different. Broken Arrow schools go way beyond the city of Broken Arrow. Uh -huh. They go into Catoosa, they go well, into Coweta. I, I see what you're saying, Jaylee, but I think as long as you're showing us the growth of the schools in Broken Arrow, that we can compare that with, even if it's another page of the growth of residential versus multifamily, et cetera. It, they could be separate, that's fine. Okay, we, we, we can, can, we can, look we can at get it. that because if you combine that, for example, everything okay, north of 51st, north of Ash Grove is in the city of Tulsa, mm -hmm. but it's broken our school district. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the enrollment of the two schools oh, on yeah. 51st Street, mm -hmm. half the it kids are coming from Tulsa. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. They're not in Broken Arrow. Yeah. And, and Bixby a has a school. Right there. Right. Well, see, that makes sense because you got housing additions that are in the outside of the city limits, but they're going like Park Lane Elementary. Mm -hmm. So that's different too. Park Lane itself mm. is outside the city. <laughs> well, one of Park the things Lane you do in a city. They're right down the street from me, so that's yeah. one of the things I think you have to be careful with when you're talking about capacity, though, is that. Uh, Graham, you might be able to answer this, uh, but it, I believe that some of it, there's been some state regulations that have changed on the capacity of classrooms. So your capacity of a school in 1970 uh -huh. might have been much greater than it is in 1995 mm -hmm. because of regulations on how many students could be Limiting. in a building, even though the yeah. building didn't change. Yeah, right. yeah I may have used the wrong word, capacity. Yeah. Now, just to step back, the, the contract with the consultants does not include schools. No, the hey. schools have done their own master plan. Right, sure. Yeah, right. And Broken Arrow School has a lot of that data on their website. And Union has sent us quite a bit of data, though half of Union is in, or more than half, is 60% is in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so we have that data and we can bring that to you showing the school enrollment. Well, so, okay, that was one. Then we'll provide percentage of housing types. Somebody asked that question, so I'm making notes to come back with that. A, a line chart growth for multifamily, how we've grown. And somebody asked, where are people moving from? 8.9, I saw the figure today, 8.9% are moving from within MSA. One was a metropolitan statistical area, which is seven counties around Tulsa. That's our oh, MSA. Seven. So I could be off on the 8.9. Between 8.9 and 11 percent are moving within this area. They're moving to Broken Arrow. So the question would be, why? Why is somebody moving to Broken Arrow, and where are they moving from? And we have a recent figure that we collected just this week is uh, has gone up to the demographic question foreign born citizens have grown dramatically broken air has a large percentage not a large number of citizens and only 52 or 53 percent are of those foreign born citizens are naturalized mm. 40 uh, 
47 or 46 percent or not. After they were eligible to be to go through the naturalization process? I don't know. Hmm. That's an IRS question. Hmm. Uh, or uh, You sure I'm know a lot of numbers, Farhad. I, I've, I've been working on that all through the... <laughs> He's a nerd. I've been <laughs> studying this today and uh, the last few weeks. I thought you did a great job on President Thank Townsend. you. We'll, get, we'll bring all that data to you all next, uh, or not next meeting, but yeah. I've got it. in the next presentation. I've got that number for you. It's just shy of 39,000 that's prepared December 1st by the Department of Commerce for Oklahoma. Wow, that's so, fast. Thank you. Yep. Wow. For the school. I appreciate it. Uh, for jobs. jobs in Broken Arrow. Oh, jobs like actual Broken. jobs that could be yeah. worked in Broken Arrow. Yeah, 39,000, 39. or sorry, 38,000. Let me look at it. Ah, come on. 39, I just lost it. It was just, just shy of 39,000. That doesn't correlate with this uh, by industry. Let's see here. Um, 38,755. Well, but so what you're saying though is this is where people are are working. Twenty two percent of those people, these are these are our residents, twenty two percent of them work in Broken Arrow, right? Mm -hmm. But there's an awful lot of people that come to Broken Arrow to work that don't mm -hmm. live here. Yeah. Like half our city staff. Yeah. Right. So we'll have a Wait, what? That's not a requirement? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, it, it, you, think, you think about it, it and this kind of goes back to the, to the housing thing, City right? staff has to live in Broken Arrow. Uh, that's 38,700. They're laughing at us. <laughs> we have to. Okay. I mean, some of us okay. live in Broken Arrow. <laughs> well, I, I, I came, I don't know, it might have been about six years ago, but I remember what was really appealing to me, uh, there was a some type of designation or award about being the safest community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the state or in the region. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, hearing it enough and seeing it enough. Might have been a PSA, might have just also just been on local news. But I found that you know incredibly desirable. We, um, we're typically within the top 50 safest mm -hmm. cities in the, in the United States uh -huh. for our size. Yeah. Um, and we're often in the top 30. That was a big, big deal to me when looking for for my first home. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember when there was like no murders in Broken Arrow and then all of a sudden that guy got murdered at 71st and Garnett, remember that? And we'd have been all right if they would have just done it on that Kicked side. Kicked him across the street. <laughs> well, they would have been on that side of the intersection, but it was just on this side, so it was on Broken Arrow yeah. side. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, for me, it's that interesting be in the to, to think about those kinds of numbers with the, with the employment Probably not. to kind of see what that commute looks like. like, like where does our workforce come from? Yeah. You know, we know about 22% of the people that live here work here, which means that the other, you know, what is that, 68% are coming from somewhere else. And then it's also saying that, you know, our workforce is going somewhere else to work. So, Well, you know, and they're the ones on social media. They're the ones leaving to go to work in Tulsa or wherever, and they're also the ones coming in broken mm -hmm. out of work. Mm -hmm. They're all driving on them roads. So, yeah. I find it pretty fascinating myself. So. It's nice being retired. You don't kind of worry about that. <laughs> Far hard. What, we yes, appreciate your hard work on this yeah. Thank very you. well. Absolutely. Thank you. We, what we would recommend is that uh, staff recommends that you accept this report and recommend it to be forwarded for acceptance to the city council and the advisory committee. So we need a motion for that. Mm -hmm. Well, just a motion to approve, and this is yeah. a preliminary report. So okay. yeah, this is preliminary. And I guess you'll let. When you present at the city council, you'll give an idea of kind of the discussions we had about this, right? So. And we, we will have all the data that you have requested also by the okay. time. Because I already have that. We didn't put it in this presentation. Fe February 6th. Mm -hmm. Well, in the spirit of Mr. Gorenson, can we also get the number of people that like red? <laughs> 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 I don't know how to take that. <laughs> so I'll make. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. I do I'll like make a motion green. to approve the preliminary report for the housing demographic study. Thank you. I will second. We have a motion and a second to accept the preliminary housing um, report. Please Mindy Payne. Oh, sorry. yes. That's all right. <laughs> Jason Cohen. She's yes. Jonathan Townsend. Yes. Robert Gornson. Yes. Jaylee Klimpa. Yes. OK. 
Okay. Next item, item nine, remarks, inquiries, and comments by planning commission and staff. I have one. I just, oh it's, this is real quick. <laughs> I just want to thank staff and mainly McKenzie for when you sent out the email requesting the signs to be posted on the zoning changes, yes. the big yellow signs. It's really, I used to not get those, but now, you know, you've been putting mail for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really good because I could see them in advance of the agenda come out. That way I could drive by them. I don't have to wait for the day before or two days before. Right. It makes a big difference yeah, to have I them agree. ahead of time. Yeah. Okay. So, like Yay. I said, I have, it just really helps. Thanks. I'm glad. Okay. Now, I hope I didn't get you in trouble for saying that, but yeah, that's good. I doubt Yeah, it's bad. I don't, think so. no, <laughs> I don't think so. No, it's good to see those in advance yeah. of the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anything else? Okay. Thanks again, Farhad. Um, we have one item left. Move to adjourn. Second. Please call the roll. Y'all are fast. Mindy Payne? Yes. Jason Cohen? Yes. Jonathan Townsend? Yes. Robert Gornson? Yes. Jaylee Klimpa? Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, I, I hope you know. I was just. Oh, no, no. Kidding. I thought it was just funny. Spirit. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> just... All I know is if we are ever at a funeral together, the three of us cannot sit on the bench next to each other. <laughs> you know, I know. What did you say? Good job. If we're ever at a funeral, <laughs> some of us will not be able to sit next to each other. Well, you know, I'll tell you right now. 